Hi, I'm Steve and this is the story of my XJR15. I love Jaguar racing cars more than Jaguar cars, just to be clear, right? I think Jaguar has a tremendous uh, history, particularly at Le Mans, of course, right? Uh, and then as a teenager watching TWR take them back and win uh, against Porsche, uh, who were dominant at that time, right? Uh, it was just tremendous. And I think all, all sort of British motorsport fans probably feel the same way, right? Uh, I wish they'd do it again. But um, so yes, yeah, so it's very exciting. And then for them to build not just this, but the XJ220 as well with Tom Walkinshaw Racing, which is for me as a teenager, just amazing, right? Uh, and so, you know, one day when I grew up and had the money to buy one, it just seemed like uh, the obvious thing to do. Yeah, and they, and they raced, right? I mean, those cars raced and they raced successfully. Um, and they made very limited numbers. This, there's only 50 of this one. The CLK GTR, I think there's only about 35 of those, right? The homologation was very, very reasonably defined for the manufacturer. They just had to find some well-heeled buyers and they were there off racing, right? I love the CLK GTR as well. They're about $4 million, I think, one sold for at the weekend. So. They're getting horrendously expensive, uh, as all these cars are. But, um, but yeah, amazing, absolutely amazing. It's the end of the analog era, right? The, these, these are the ultimate analog supercars where, where racing technology was applied. And this thing is packed full of racing technology. So is the McLaren, so is the XJ220, actually. Um, and they represent to me the pinnacle of that period of supercar design. After that, everything became much more electronic and controlled and nanny state and all those things, right? Um, whereas to drive this uh, or any, any car from that period takes uh, you know, real effort. It takes real skill. Uh, and so for me, this is just a, you know, nostalgic perhaps because I was a teenager then, but, but just looking back, uh, I really think that is you know, at the very peak of, uh, of design of this sort of car. Uh, Tom Walkinshaw Racing uh, manufactured uh, a series of cars uh, that were racing cars, purely for Group C and, and Le Mans uh, racing. Uh, they're based on the V12 uh, Jaguar engine, but only, only light, lightly of course, because once you've turned it into a seven brake, 700 brake horsepower engine, um, you've done quite a lot with it. So they, they started, uh, must have been XGR 6 perhaps, or 8, I can't remember exactly. Um, XJR9 was the car that won Le Mans, that's the famous one, and it went all the way up to XJR12 um, with the V12 engine. Uh, XJR11 and XJR10 had the, the engine from the XJ220. This is a lot of technical detail, by the way. Then <laughs> um, the series continued, the XJR14 uh, was the, their final um, World Championship winning car, which was basically a a Formula One car with Group C bodywork. I mean, it was an amazing car, right? Um, and then this is really the end of the, the line, right? They built this road car, um, road, sorry, road racing car um, to celebrate their success at Le Mans. Um, and that's it. And then they, then Group C kind of folded, um, must have been 1991, 1992, so at the end of that series. Um, and this, this was the result. Uh, so yeah, all that technology is carried through to this, this road car. And as, as we walk around later, you'll have a look at it. Um, it's almost indistinguishable uh, from a, an engineering point of view from a Group C car. So a lot of car companies had tried to experiment with carbon fiber at the time and applying race car technology, but this really did take a Le Mans winning car. They just sculpted it slightly for the road and they, they made it into a road car. Um, and it was sold for half a million pounds. And they attached this amazing race series to it, the uh, Intercontinental Challenge. I just felt, well, okay, so this really is the first carbon fiber road car. Um, TWR pioneers, as, as were McLaren, in the use of this technology. Um, and you are literally driving a Group C car on the road, which is a pretty unique experience, as you'll find out later today, right? Uh, not always a pleasurable one, actually, but uh, certainly unique. So, <laughs> uh, and I do love it. So, um, you know. It's an amazing thing. Yeah, I mean, at that time, so carbon fiber was uh, extremely difficult to apply technology that only a very few companies knew how to use, right? And they were in the racing business because they needed lightweight and they needed strength, right? So the idea of putting it to a road car as, as, as a load-bearing, you know, full chassis uh, would have been, at that time, a very, very expensive decision to make, um, which is why, you know, this was the first one to do it. That's why it cost, at that time, half a million quid. Uh, now, I remember my parents buying a house at that time, and it was, you know, a relatively modest house, but I think it was like a tenth of that, yeah? So, you know, add inflation, you know, that's sort of a couple of million quid or more in today's terms, um, because it was very, very new technology. Um, nowadays, you can, you know, technology's moved on. Um, so, yeah, so the first 
road car to apply the technology, uh, and then the glorious V12 engine, uh, which funnily enough, Jaguar actually did develop originally for Le Mans uh, back in the late 60s, before, again, regulations changed and it became redundant. So they stuck it in a road car, um, but a fantastic engine. I mean, everyone who's ever worked with this engine says it is a, a work of art. Um, and uh, they did a really good job with it. So it's still in their road cars up until uh, the end of the 90s. Um, shame they don't use it anymore, the way V12. Um, so yeah, uh, and then you've got the, obviously it did race. So this is, this is actually raced by Cor Oizer, uh in the, uh, in the series. He did pretty well. Um, I think he came second at Spa. I've got some lovely footage of it being almost wrecked at Silverstone. So yeah, it's, it's just a very interesting car to own. Everyone, everyone who goes in it thinks it's amazing, um, although they often don't want to repeat the experience. So this one is chassis number seven. It was built in February 1991, uh, and uh, they, they built 16 racing cars, which this, this is a racing car, and they built another 34 or so so-called road cars. They're actually very similar. The only difference really being is this one actually did race in the Inter Intercontinental, Ch Intercontinental Challenge. It's been at Monaco, Silverstone and Spa, supporting the F1 that year. It has uh, no synchro mesh in the gearbox, uh, so it's quite hard to drive actually. And it just, and that's about, that's really the only difference actually. Uh, and, and bucket seats as opposed to a bit of leather, but that's it. Yeah, so the chassis, the, the underlying uh, technology was, was all Tony Southgate. Uh, so he was the engineer who um, designed the Le Mans winning cars. Uh, then uh, in terms of the, the history, they actually tried to pretty much put the Le Mans car, the, the Group C car, on the road. They realised it looked ridiculous, but they don't for some reason quite look right when you try and drive on the road. And the ground clearance, of course, is horrendous. So even if you try and sort of pump it up a little bit, then it looks even more ridiculous, right? Tom hired uh, Peter Stevens might have been a Lamborghini at the time, I think, to come and design a road car. Um, he did it amazingly quickly. I met him actually, he's a lovely guy. And he showed me some pictures of uh, the clay model and everything else. So, uh, so yeah, so he did this and on the back of that, I think McLaren hired him to then do the, the F1. And as you can see, there are some fairly strong similarities, very taut design, uh, you know, very sort of uh, almost stumpy back end, right? There isn't a lot hanging over the back. So it feels like a very taut design. It's quite, this is even more compact than the F1, of course, because this, this only has to carry two passengers. Um, but no, he's an amazing designer. Someone should give him another, another car to design, I think. <laughs> yeah, so it's a bit of a decision. So when, when they launched the car, this was the livery they launched it with. And then when they raced them, they just let the owners kind of put whatever stickers they wanted on. So this actually came to me with the, uh, the stickers that it used, um, the livery in the, in the race series. But I thought it looked better like this. So I, I, when I had it restored, um, I took it back to the, the show car um, livery. Um, you know, I could always have it wrapped if I wanted to, as the, or have it resprayed as the, as the, <laughs> as it as it raced. Uh, so people ask me about that, uh, and I must, well, I wasn't sure at the time if it was the right decision, um, but I think you'll agree it does look spectacular in this this livery. So, you know, my car, my rules, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, when did I buy? Oh, it must have been about seven years ago, I think. Um, and at that time, a lot of these cars went to Japan. So you had a choice. You could either get one from Japan. I think almost half the stock were in Japan. Um, or there were a couple of cars in the UK and there were a couple in the US. Um, so I got this via uh, Don Law. I'm pretty sure you know Don Law, right? Um, so he specializes in XJ220s, but he obviously, uh, if you know Justin, is a, an amazing driver up that hill at uh, Goodwood, right, in the XJR9. Um, so they also prepare very similar cars, uh, Group C cars, for racing. So he had started um, uh, looking at these cars and working out how to support them. Uh, and one of his customers had one for sale, so we just did a deal. Uh, this had been in a museum, actually, uh, so for quite a long time. So it was really a barn find, effectively. It was dusty. Um, I had a lot of work done to it to make it a bit more usable on the road. Uh, and it is, you know, it's quite a civilized car now. It's not like a normal car. So basically, I prepare for driving it as if, now I'm not a pilot, but I imagine if I was a pilot, the way you think about flying a plane, right? You've got to, you've got to have in your mind, step by step, uh, you know, going through the starting sequence, even just getting into the thing, right? You've got to do it in a certain way. So it's quite structured. Uh, how you engage with the car, right? And if you do anything in a way that you haven't thought through, you'll end up in tears, right? Uh, you know, you'll scrape it on something or uh, you won't start it in the right way and then it'll stall. And, you know, there's a lot of, lot of stuff you've got to think about, right? 
Um, and then when you're on the road as well, you're constantly thinking ahead and you've, you're really thinking this is you know, not a normal car. You've got to really think about gear changes and timing of everything very carefully or it ends up being a very unpleasant experience, right? For you, your passenger, and potentially for other road users. It's, it's, it's you know, all part if you're, you know, I did an engineering degree, I'm a sort of tech kind of guy, right? It sort of appeals to people who are into that kind of thing, because uh, it, is, it is a unique experience. And also the smell, because it's, it's quite a vintage car still. It's still a V12, it stinks of petrol, right? So you walk into the garage and it's, that, that scent is there, right? So <laughs> it's quite extraordinary. Every passenger, you have to really explain to them how they get in, otherwise they, they just end up stuck. I mean, literally they can't get in, right? So you've got to sort of slide yourself in a certain way. It's very tight in there. Once you're in, it's quite comfortable. What they always do as well, they always slam the bloody door, right? It's a really light door. It literally just, you literally just pull it with a sort of a string, but they always slam it, right, for some reason. And then you've got to put the cans on, right, because it's so loud in there, um, and get the, uh, the little the volume right so you can speak to your passenger. I've tried driving without them and it is just unbearable. It's very involved, very draining actually. I mean, it's, it's hard work um, because it's, it's got the steering rack, it's got the racing steering, so it's very, very um, twitchy to drive, right? Uh, it's very, very torquey engines. So you only have to squeeze the throttle a little bit and it'll just shoot off. Um, and as you know, the roads around here are a bit, uh, they're slightly bendy, so you've got to be quite careful. Um, but it's very involving. I mean, it's, it's what you want. You don't buy a car like this unless you want that as an experience, right? Um, and I think it probably is the ultimate road, road car experience other than an F1 GTR or something like that because it is just so involving. You can't switch off for a second. destination mentally exhausted as well as physically exhausted because it's hot um, and uh, you know it's quite quite a physically hard car to drive um, but no, I love it you know you know every, every gear change requires you to think ahead every brake every every corner just like you would driving a racing car um, and that's that's why you buy a car like this a stressed uh, member of the chassis so it, it, it carries the load of the suspension through to the chassis and it's literally bolted to the chassis so there's no there's no coupling at all um, so it's a pretty smooth engine I mean it doesn't feel like you know you're sort of vibrating a lot it's almost turbine like but it, it does give it again a different experience because I think that you know when I said earlier about you you hit the throttle and you just really feel it I think part of it is just you are literally strapped to the engine and the engine is, is connected to the road via the wheels. Uh, and there really isn't much separating you from that experience. So yeah, uh, and I've obviously you've got the noise as well, right? So it is quite immediate and you'll hear again the gearbox sound in there. Uh, it does whine a lot because they're straight cut gears, um, which overpowers the engine noise when you're at speed. So uh, it's, quite, it's quite something else, it really is. You're, used to it. you're actually quite in the center of the car as well. So that takes a little while to get used to. Um, so when I bought the car, I, ended up, I kept driving it. Um, too near the white line because of course you, you're kind of accustomed to driving quite near the edge of the car but here you're right in the center um, that's actually because it's, it's very easy to, to reach there it's very natural actually when you go back to drive a normal car I don't know why that just feels more natural right um, so I didn't have a massive problem with that rather than I just had to keep remembering it's that hand rather than this hand um, and it's, it's very snug so it's, it's all designed around the drivers it just it just it just 
you know, really kind of feels ergonomically very, very um, well designed actually. Even though it's quite cramped, uh, everything falls to hand. It's really quite, uh, yeah, quite good from an ergonomic point of view. Uh, yeah, so when you're changing gear, you just got to remember it's your right hand that goes to the gear lever. It's, it's, it's right next to the steering wheel. It's really, and it's really quick because it has uh, the dog box. So uh, you can actually change gear without the clutch. I mean, if you're changing, um, you're going through the gears, it's actually quite easy just to slam it through. It's uh, quite incredible, right? And then the only thing you've got to remember is when you're changing down, I mean, you've got to just double declutch to do it nice and smooth, um, or you're going to get a bit of a crunch, right? But, uh, you know, I know other people with, with dog boxes, they, and they love them. Uh, I'm still getting to love this one, but I'll get there. <laughs> the thing with this car is that every drive lives in the memory forever. I mean, you don't forget a drive, even if you're just pottering around on the local roads. It, it lives in a way that no other drive does, right? To choose just one drive as a, as a particularly memorable one, I'd actually choose the first one I ever did, which is a slightly insane thing to do, but I picked it up, uh, it must have been sort of March time, from Don Law. Now he's in Stoke-on-Trent and I live here and I thought God, I could have had it trailed at home but I thought no, I'm going to go up there and I'm going to drive it home which was a mad thing to do because it's a very difficult car to drive. I'd never had done, done a car with uh, no synchro mesh before right and it was actually still quite wintry. We had a lot of uh, snow so I was literally driving through parts of it were you know going through snow. Uh, it tipped down with rain for about an hour on the motorway coming back, right? So, uh, and it's quite a twitchy car, yeah? You can imagine, you don't have to do much with that throttle before uh, you're losing traction. Um, you know, and then you've got the, it's got no fuel gauge. You've got to look, like, all that stress of worrying about, will I run out of petrol? Um, but it was amazing. Uh, so, I, I, every single mile of that journey, I can replay back to you. It's 250 miles, did the country loop, and by this time I was absolutely shattered, right? And I felt, being absurd to say this, of course, that I was driving, and at Le Mans, right, I was really tired, I was hot, but every single sensation of driving that car uh, was just amazing, and I didn't want to stop. Yeah, I didn't want to stop. And I got here and I thought, I could go back, this is just too amazing. So I've done some long drives since then, but never one quite as long as that, right, because uh, I figure uh, I might not survive it, right? <laughs> you know, when I bought the car, so I did that massive drive, and then I didn't touch it for a couple of weeks, because I just thought I'd need to get over that, right? And I went back out, so you open the garage door, the, the smell of the petrol hits you, and you're almost thinking, do I really want to do this, right? Uh, it's, it's like the, the experience of a, a bullfight I must feel uh, when they're about to go into the ring, right? Or St. George and the Dragon, or something. You know, that taming of the beast is the experience you get, that kind of primeval fear, you know, that primeval desire to sh you know, demonstrate to yourself that you can do it, right? And I would say the first 20 drives, they felt just like that, right? It was. It was just, okay, I'm just gonna have to calm myself down, you know. If I'd had a chill pill, I would've taken it, right? And just, again, going through, but going through that sequence helps, right? It is literally just, you know, the logic of the car is, 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 uh, is, is straightforward, right? Uh, and that helps you kind of emotionally uh, connect with it and get over your fear, because it is a pretty frightening thing to drive. Uh, now, actually, I'm, I'm very, very accustomed to it, right? It's actually, I'll just drive it today and we'll be fine, right? Um, but I know Don, when, when he sold me the car, he said, People have bought these cars and they've never got over that fear and they've just let them sit in their garage and then they've just sold them on because they just couldn't face driving it. <laughs> so, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta be of the right sort of mindset. And actually, I, I'll say this, the people that buy them now, they are racing drivers, yeah? So they, they don't have that, that thing to get over, right? If you step out of your, um, you know, your, your fast saloon and try and drive this, it will just, it will just feel just too scary.